Thank you for listening to Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. We are now continuing with Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism, with Roy Shulman. Hi, this is Roy Shulman, and welcome again to Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism, the show on Radio Maria that celebrates the Jewish roots of the Catholic Church, or seen the other way around, that celebrates the fulfillment, the full realization of all of the promise of Judaism in the Catholic Church and her sacraments. Now, one of the wonderful things, I, I, there's an infinite number of wonderful things about the Catholic Church, but one of the wonderful things is the uh, schedule, the, the, the um, calendar of feasts throughout the year. Uh, we've just come off of uh, Pentecost. We're actually still in Pentecost, in the octave of Pentecost. It used to be celebrated as a full octave, um, but whatever. We had Pentecost last Sunday a feast that honored the Holy Spirit. And of course we have, I'm tempted to say dozens of feasts throughout the year that honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But of course we know that God is a Trinity. And so one can from time to time feel a little bit sorry for God the Father, who is the source of everything, including in some sense the most holy Trinity, who doesn't even have a feast day. But the closest thing he has to a feast day is what's coming up tomorrow, which is the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity. So I thought I would dedicate today's show to the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, try to um, honor and reverence God the Father, as well as the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in thinking about how to um, dedicate the show to celebrating the Most Holy Trinity, it occurred to me that I couldn't do better than by talking about Saint um, Elizabeth of the Trinity, who is a recently canonized Carmelite saint whose entire spirituality revolved around the Most Holy Trinity and the indwelling of the Most Holy Trinity. So that is my plan for uh, at least much of today. Perhaps it'll be for all of today. Um, this is a, a live call-in program, and the number here is 866-333-6279 or 866-333-MARY, M-A-R-Y, if you wish to call with a comment or a question or a complaint. And uh, however, until, until and unless calls come in, I will talk about Elizabeth of the Trinity and perhaps if time permits, I will also talk a, a little bit, continue a, a kind of ongoing uh, discussion that I have about the gift of the Holy Spirit of wisdom and just what that means and uh, what the implications of praying for the gift of wisdom from the Holy Spirit is. But I'll start with Elizabeth of the Trinity and see where it leads me. So in any case, her dates are 1880. She was born in 1880 and died in 1906, which you'll figure out rather easily is at the age of 26. And she was a Carmelite nun in France. She got, well, she was born into a um, upper middle class family, I would say. She was uh, very beautiful as a young woman. She was very gifted. She was an extremely talented pianist. She loved life. Uh, she loved the social life, which in those days revolved around uh, parties and horseback riding and, and um, uh, staying at other people's houses over vacations and things like that. And she was very happy in that life. And she also, by the way, had a number of suitors, a number of young men who were charmed by her, her beauty and her refinement and her um, elegance and her sweetness and wished to marry her. But she felt a call to dedicate herself to God. She turned down all of her suitors. And then at the age of 21, she entered the Carmelite convent in Dijon, which actually was only a few hundred yards from the family's house. And she was very, very happy as a young uh, Carmelite and uh, as a matter of fact, she wrote um, soon after entering the Carmel, quote, um, I find him, meaning God, everywhere while doing the wash as well as while praying. 
Um, and uh, anyway, she she was, as I think most saints, I know people like to talk about mystics, as though there's something different about a saint being a mystic or a saint not being a mystic. But it seems to me that that mystical experience essentially is part and parcel of union with God. And by the time one becomes a saint, one has established quite a profound union with God. So one is going to have had some fairly significant mystical experiences. But in any case, Elizabeth of the Trinity is considered a, a mystic saint as well as a spiritual writer because um, she wrote uh, most of what she wrote were letters, but she wrote a lot of letters to people she loved and um, her um, her journals and so forth. But much of them have been published and it is quite a, a body of, of uh, beautiful spiritual writing. So I'll be drawing from them. So I will simply start. Um, I'll, I'll just start. Um, uh, I'll start perhaps by reading some of her prayers that she wrote. This this one that I'm about to read is kind of her signature prayer. It's probably her most well-known prayer. So let me recollect myself in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh my God, Trinity whom I adore, Help me to become utterly forgetful of self, that I may bury myself in you as changeless and as calm as though my soul were already in eternity. May nothing disturb my peace or draw me out of you, O oh, my unchangeable Lord. May I at every moment penetrate more deeply into the depths of thy mystery. Give peace to my soul, make it thy heaven, thy cherished dwelling place, thy home of rest. Let me never leave thee there alone, but keep me there, all absorbed in thee, in living faith, adoring thee, and wholly yielded up to thy creative action. O my Christ, whom I love, crucified by love, fain would I be the bride of thy heart, fain would I cover thee with glory and love thee, until I die of very love. Yet I realize my weakness, and beseech thee to clothe me with thyself, to identify my soul with all the movements of thine own. Immerse me in thyself, possess me wholly, substitute thyself for me, that my life may be but a radiance of thine own. Enter my soul as adorer, as restorer, as savior. O eternal word, utterance of my God, I long to pass my life in listening to thee, to become docile, that I may learn all from thee. Through all darkness, all privations, all helplessness, I crave to keep thee ever with me and to dwell beneath thy lustrous beams. O oh, my beloved star, so hold me that I cannot wander from thy light. O oh, consuming fire, spirit of love, Descend within me and reproduce in me, as it were, an incarnation of the Word, that I may be to him another humanity in which he renews his mystery. And thou, O Father, bend down toward thy poor creature and overshadow her, beholding in her none other than thy beloved Son, in whom thou hast set all thy pleasure. O oh, my three, my all, my beatitude, infinite solitude, immensity in which I lose myself, I yield myself to thee as I pray. Bury thyself in me, that I may be buried in thee, until I depart to contemplate in thy light the abyss of thy greatness. And so ends the prayer that she wrote in um, 1904 to the Most Holy Trinity. Now, I um, neglected to mention, of course, that the reason she's known as St. Elizabeth of the Trinity is that she took the name and religion of Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity. And as I mentioned, her spirituality was centered on 
the fact of the Most Holy Trinity, and in particular on the indwelling of the Most Holy Trinity. And I will read some um, excerpts from her writing that are about the um, indwelling Holy Trinity, which is the center of her spirituality. Now, um, she was obviously French. She wrote in French. And um, the book that I have is actually in French. So you'll have to bear with me if I sometimes hesitate in order to find the correct English words for um, the, the little snippets of her writing that I'm going to be trying to read to you. The most holy trinity, that is our home, our house, our father's house where from which we must never leave. Um, and as I said, this is now I'm going to read um, from a, a little paragraph from a letter she wrote about her taking the name Sister Elizabeth of the Most Holy Trinity. That which you're saying to me about my name uh, makes me happy. I love it so much. It speaks to me of my entire vocation. And in thinking about it, my soul is carried off under the grand vision of the mystery of mysteries. To say that the good God calls us by our vocation to live under such holy clarity. What a lovable mystery of, lo of charity. I would like to respond in passing. No, uh, let me start that sentence over again. <laughs> I, I would like to reciprocate by passing my time on earth like the Holy Virgin, guarding all things in my heart, burying myself, so to speak, in the bottom of my soul in order to lose myself in the Trinity that, that inhabits there to transform myself into her. Thus, my, the name I took, my luminous ideal, as you call it, will be realized, and I will truly be Elizabeth of the Trinity. I hope I, I hope my translation improves as I go along here. I must stay with you tonight. This is my master that expresses this desire. That's a quote from the scriptures, I'll be staying with you tonight, that Jesus says to one of the disciples. It's necessary that I stay with you. That is my master that expresses this desire. My master that wishes to live in me with the Father and his spirit of love in order that, according to the well-beloved disciple, I may reside with him, with them. During the morning, this word spoke itself at the bottom of my soul. Quote, if somebody loves me, my father will love him. We will come to him and we will dwell within him. Close quote, again from Jesus in the scriptures. At the same instant, I saw how true this was. I cannot describe how the three divine persons revealed themselves but nonetheless, I saw them keeping in me their counsel of love, and it seemed to me that I still see them. Oh, how great God is, and that we are loved by him. It is the love, this infinite love, that surrounds us and wants to associate itself with us here below in all of its beatitude. It's all of the Trinity that reposes in us, all of this mystery, which will be our vision in heaven. Our Father who is in heaven, it's in this little heaven 
that he has made in the center of our soul that we must seek him and above all in which we must reside i'll repeat that maybe a little bit better our father who is in heaven it's in this little soul that he has made excuse me it's in this little heaven that he's made in the center of our soul where we must seek him and above all where we must must reside the furnace of love burns in us and it is nothing else than the holy spirit the same love which is in the trinity and which is the union of the father and his word it is at the bottom of my soul there where the holy spirit lives where i must recollect myself and where i must withdraw in the heaven of our soul let us be praise of the glory of the holy trinity praise of the love of our immaculate mother uh, now i'm going to read a short paragraph from a letter she wrote to her much beloved little sister you are deprived of receiving as often as you would want that is receiving communion you are being deprived of receiving communion as often as you would like and i well understand your sacrifice but think that his love doesn't need the sacrament to come to his little german that's that was her sister's name communion with him all day because he is living in your soul listen to what our father saint john of the cross and consequently your father also since you, listen to what our father saint john of the cross said oh the most beautiful of creatures the soul that desires so ardently to know the place where your well-beloved is found to seek him and to unite yourself to him you are yourself the shelter where he takes shelter the home where he hides himself your well-beloved your treasure your soul hope is so close to you that he lives within you and to speak truly you cannot be without him end of quote he has shown us that we don't have to we don't have to depart from ourselves to find him quote the kingdom of god is within you close quote you can believe my doctrine because it isn't mine if you read the gospel according to saint john you will see that at every moment the master insists on this commandment reside in me and i in you I love so much this mystery of the Most Holy Trinity. It's an it's a abyss into which I lose myself. Oh, my sister, this feast of the three, that's what we're coming up on tomorrow, this feast of the three is my own. For me, there is no other like it. It is so good at carmel because it is a feast of silence and adoration i have never so well understood this mystery and the entire vocation that rests in my name that there is in my name it seems to me that i found heaven on earth because heaven that is god is in my soul the day that I understood that, everything lit up in me, and I want to say that this secret and I want to quietly tell this secret to those that I love so that they too, in everything, will adhere always to God and realize this prayer of Christ, Father, 
that they all be that they be one as you and I are one. Okay, well, rather than go through this um, wonderful treasure of dozens of these lovely short expressions, thoughts of Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity, I will go back to the text that I have that is um, <laughs> written in English or it has been translated into English because I, I don't feel I'm doing justice to you actually, to the listeners in my rather halting, uh, spontaneous translation. So I will read a, another uh, prayer of hers, which is um, uh, from a retreat she took. She, uh, during this retreat, she wrote um, eight or nine perhaps even more prayers. Each day she would write a prayer. This first prayer is the Trinity, our home. So these are again, the words of a Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity. It begins with a quote from the scripture, from the gospel according to John, quote, Father, I will that where I am, they also whom thou hast given me be with me that they may see my glory which thou hast given me, because thou hast loved me before the creation of the world." Close quote. Such is Christ's last desire, his supreme prayer, before returning to the Father. He wills that where he is, we too may be, not only through all eternity, but even in time, which is eternity begun and ever in progress. In other words, even in our time on earth between birth and death. Where then are we to be with him, that his divine ideal may be realized? The hiding place of the Son of God is in the bosom of the Father, which is the divine essence, transcending all mortal vision and hidden from all human understanding, as Isaiah said, quote, truly you are a hidden God, close quote. Yet it is his will that we should abide permanently in him, that we should dwell where he dwells in the unity of love, and that we should be, so to speak, the shadow of himself. By baptism, says St. Paul, we are buried in Christ. And again, quote, God has made us sit together in the heavenly places through Jesus Christ, that he might show in the ages to come the abundant riches of his grace. He adds, quote, now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and domestics of God. The Blessed Trinity, then, is our dwelling place, our home, our Father's house, which we should never leave. Something, huh? Um, I will simply, I'll continue with a couple of more of these not-too-long prayers that St. Elizabeth of the Trinity wrote. The second prayer is entitled, Abide in Me, quote, which is, of course, a, um, a quote from, again, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. Abide in me. This command is given, this desire expressed by the word of God. Abide in me. Not for a few moments, a few passing hours, but abide permanently, habitually. Abide in me. Pray in me, adorn me, love in me, suffer in me, work in me, act in me. Abide in me, whatever the person or action you are concerned with, penetrating ever deeper into this abode. This is the true wilderness into which God leads the soul, that he may speak to it. But to grasp the meaning of this mysterious appeal, we must do more than listen to it superficially. We must immerse ourselves deeply and more deeply still into the divinity by means of recollection. I follow after, exclaimed St. Paul. So should we descend daily by this path into the abyss which is God himself. Let us glide into its depths with loving confidence. Deep calls to deep. It is there sunk into its lowest depths, that the abyss of our nothingness will find itself face to face with the abyss of the mercy 
with the immensity of the all of God. There shall we find the strength to die to self, and losing all trace of self, we shall be transformed in love. Quote, Blessed are they who die in the Lord, close quote, which is from the Apocalypse. And now I'm just going to read one more um, of these. Uh, this is the third prayer from this retreat. It's titled, The Kingdom of God is Within You. And um, after I read this prayer, I will take a short musical break, as is my want. And uh, if you wish to call during that musical break, the number here is 866-333-6279 or 866-333-MARY with a comment or a question. And after the calls, I will continue uh, probably reading from Elizabeth of the Trinity. But here is her prayer, the kingdom of God is within you, uh, which is a, a quote from uh, the gospel according to Luke chapter 17, quote, the kingdom of God is within you, close quote. God has just invited us to abide in him, that our soul may live in the heritage of his glory. And he now reveals to us that we are not to go outside ourselves to find this inheritance, for the kingdom of God is within us. St. John of the Cross says that it is in the substance of the soul, which is inaccessible to the devil and the world, that God gives himself to it. Then all the movements of the soul become divine, and though of God still are the souls, because our Lord affects them in it and with it. The same saint also states that the center of the soul is God. When the soul loves, comprehends, and enjoys him with all its strength, it has attained to its deepest and ultimate center in God. When, however, the soul has not attained to this state, though it be in God who is the center of it, still it is not in the deepest center, because there is still room for it to advance. Love unites the soul with God, and the greater its love, the deeper does it enter God, and the more it is centered in him. Thus, a soul which has but one degree of love is already in God, who is its center. But when its love has attained the highest degree, it will have penetrated to its inmost depth or center, and will be transformed it, until it becomes most like God. To such a soul recollected in itself may be addressed Father La Cordere's, La Cordere's words to St. Mary Magdalene, quote, Ask no more after the master of anyone on earth and, or in heaven, for he is your soul, and your soul is he. End of the prayer. So, we've come to about the halfway point, so I will now go to a short musical break. But as I mentioned, um, if you wish to call in, this is a live call-in show. The number here is 866 6279 or 866333 Mary, M A R Y. And um, if you call in, then I will, coming out of the break, look at the call board and, um, you know, take the calls. And if not, I will go back to reading St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. So, with that, let's see if the music is queued up. Veni Creator Spiritus. Mentes tuorum visita, impleso per na gratia, que tu creasti pectora.
Patsem Quaerones Protinus, Doctores Sic Te Previo, Vite Mus Omne Noxiu. Okay, I think I'm back on. I hope I'm back on. And um, as far as I can tell, no calls have come in. So I will um, continue with my um, readings from St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. I'll just add a little. I mean, there are many reasons to be enchanted with St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. But um, I'm an oblate at a Benedictine monastery that is where the monks actually service the Carmelite convent where she was. So there's a um, kind of family connection there between between the monastery where I'm an oblate and St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. And most mornings when I'm at the monastery, the relics... Um, on the altar are the relics of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. So perhaps that's contributed to my love of her. I'm going to go back to trying to read some of the short uh, quotations from her writings, um, see if my French has gotten any better. Um, it seems to me that I found my heaven on earth since heaven, that is God, is in my soul. Oh, I think I read this. <laughs> I've read this already. Um, I'll continue. The day that I understood that, everything lit up in me, and I want to tell you this secret. I want to tell this secret quietly to those that I love so that they also, through everything, will always stick to God. And that, and that this prayer of Christ is realized in them. Father, May they be one as you and I are one. It's so good, isn't it, to think that, except for the vision, we possess already here below what the blessed possess up above, that we can never leave it, and we are able to never leave it, and to never let ourselves be distracted from him. Um, this abyss, this interior abyss, where we should plunge ourselves and lose ourselves, this abyss of love that we possess in us, and in which, if we are faithful to enter there, um, waits for us blessedness. Blessedness waits for us. Why not live there already? Because at the bottom of our soul we possess he who will one day be our bliss. Let us live with God as with a friend, rendering our faith living to communion to to be in communion with him throughout everything. That's what the saints did. That's what the saints did. We carry our our heaven in ourselves because he who who um, raptures the glorified in the light of the heavenly vision gives himself to us in faith and in mystery, the same, the same one. 
I'll, re I'll try that sentence again. We carry our heaven within ourselves because the one who enraptures the glorified in the vision, in the heavenly vision, is the same one who gives himself to us in faith and mystery. Now, um, read a, a, a short paragraph from a letter she wrote to her sister who married and had a family. Um, our life is in heaven. Oh, my dear sister, this heaven, this house of our father is at the center of our soul. How you see this in St. John of the Cross. When we are in our center, in our deepest center, we are in God. Isn't this simple? Isn't this consoling? Throughout everything, amidst your motherly concerns, throughout the time that you are entirely occupied with your little angels, you can withdraw into this solitude to deliver yourself to the Holy Spirit so that he transforms you into God, so that he imprints on your soul the image of the divine beauty, so that the Father <laughs> leans over you and sees no longer anything but his Christ, and that he is able to say, this one is my well-beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. O oh, little sister, in heaven I will rejoice in seeing in you, in seeing in your soul my Christ so beautiful. I really do hope that you're able to disentangle my fractured English as I try to translate these on the fly. But to listen to this entirely mysterious word, one must not stop at the surface. One must always enter more deeply into the divine being through recollection. In the silence of prayer, let us listen to him. He is the principle who speaks within us. And has he not said, That, <laughs> that which I sent is true and everything that I say I comes from him. <laughs> um, sorry, that's that quote from the Gospels that I did not get very well, but um, I say nothing that doesn't come from the Father, essentially. That which he teaches me without words at the bottom of my soul is ineffable. He illumines everything. He responds to every need. Don't you have this love of listening to him? Sometimes it's so strong, this need to be silent. One wants to not do anything else but to live as did Mary Magdalene, this beautiful sort of soul, contemplative, this beautiful type of the contemplative soul at the feet of the master, eager to listen to everything, to penetrate always more deeply into this mystery of love that he has come to reveal to us. Let us make for him in our soul a home entirely peaceful in which is always sung the canticle of love and the act and thanksgiving. 
because this great silence is an echo of he who is in God. Ah, oh, this is an interesting one. A soul that is in discussion with itself, that is occupied with his with its senses, that pursues useless thoughts, no, uh, any sort of desire, this soul disperses its strength and is not entirely ordered to God. Its lyre does not vibrate any longer in union with the master. When he touches it, he cannot make of it, he cannot make, emanate from it, divine harmonies. There's still too much of the human, which is a dissonance. I, I'm, I may try to actually explicate this because I did such a bad job uh, translating it because uh, a very beautiful thought. Uh, she is contrasting a kind of a um, noisy soul from a truly recollected soul. And a noisy soul is one that's always in discussion with itself, that's occupied with whatever's coming in through the senses, that follows any sort of useless thought, that follows any kind of useless desire. Such a soul disperses its strength, it's chaotic inside, it's everything in it is not entirely ordered to God. And therefore, when God touches that soul, its inner harp, so to speak, cannot vibrate in union with the master. Um, the master can't make that harp sound with divine harmonies because there is too much human noise still going on it that creates a dissonance. Um, this is really, in a way, I, I'm, I'm circling around the issue, but St. Elizabeth of the Trinity's spirituality, is, it's actually, it's all about recollection. It's all about making a home for the most holy trinity in our souls by quieting our souls, first of all, by, of course, not polluting our souls with sin, but then with stilling our souls so that it's a peaceful, quiet place where the Most Holy Trinity can dwell. And also, that's a sufficiently peaceful and quiet, quiet so that when the Most Holy Trinity is dwelling there, we are able to hear what they are saying. We are able to be in communion with God. We are able to hear the voice of God in our souls because we're not making too much noise ourselves. Well, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I'll continue with these short readings. It, it is the spouse. Silence. 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 That's it. That's the whole citation from St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. The spouse is coming. Be quiet. Silence. 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 He stands at the door and knocks. And we have to still ourselves so that we can hear the knocking and so that we can let him in and so that we can hear what he says when he enters. Okay, continuing. The language of the word, it is the infusion of a gift. It is he who speaks in our soul in silence. If you had any idea how happy I am in the solitude of my hospital room, my master is there with me, and we live night and day in a sweet heart to heart. I appreciate ever more my happiness at being a Carmelite. I keep quiet, I listen to him. It is so good to hear everything he says, for I love him. O oh, eternal word, word of my God, I want to spend my life listening to you. I want to make myself entirely teachable in order to learn everything from you. I also want that this be the beginning of an act of adoration 
which never stops in my soul. Christ said one day to the Samaritan woman that God the Father seeks true adorers in spirit and in truth. To give joy to his heart, let us be these true adorers. Let us love him in spirit. That's to say, let us have our heart and our thoughts fixed on him. Our, our mind full of knowledge of him by the light of faith. Let us adore him in truth, that's to say, through our works, because it's through our acts above all that we are true. This is to always do that which pleases the Father, whose children we are. Finally, let us adore in spirit and truth, that is, through Jesus Christ and with Jesus Christ, because he alone is the true adorer in spirit and in truth. I'm going to repeat that. <laughs> I can't stop. The stuff is so beautiful. Christ once one day told the Samaritan woman that God the Father seeks true adorers in spirit and truth. To give joy to his heart, let us be these true adorers. Let us adore him in spirit. That's to say, with our hearts and thoughts fixed on him. Our, our minds full of his knowledge by the light of faith. Let us adore him in truth. That's to say, through our works because it is above all through our acts that we are true. It is to do everything that pleases the Father whose children we are. Finally, let us adore in spirit and in truth, that's to say, through Jesus Christ and with Jesus Christ, because he alone is the true adorer in spirit and in truth. The kingdom of God is within you. Enter into this small kingdom to adore the sovereign that resides there as in his own palace. He loves you so much. Okay. Um, I will go back to reading um, some of her prayers that uh, exist in uh, translation that I have. Um, I will tell you if you're interested I, I i doubt that the book is still in print but the english i'm reading from is from an excellent book by father philippon p-h-i-l-i-p -I -I -P, like philip o-n at the end philippon called the spiritual doctrine of sister elizabeth and um the french book that i'm reading from um which is priceless i don't know if it exists in english is um, Thoughts of Elizabeth of the Trinity, Volume 1, You Are the Home of God, You Are the House of God, Vous êtes la Maison de Dieu. Okay, um, going back to the English text. The fourth prayer that came from this retreat of hers is, is entitled, If Anyone Love Me. And it begins with another quote, from the Gospel according to St. John. If anyone love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our abode with him. Close quote. Again, the Master tells us that he desires to dwell within us, if anyone love me. It is this which draws God to his creature, not an emotional love, but a love strong as death, which many waters cannot quench. I love the Father, and so I do always the things that please him. Those, by the way, were little snippets of quotes from the Canticle of Canticles and uh, the gospel, uh, gospel according to John. Thus spoke our blessed Master, and every soul that longs to keep close to him should live by this word. Such a soul should make the divine will its food, its daily bread, it should allow itself to be immolated at the pleasure of the Father, as was the crucified Christ whom it adores. Every occurrence, every event, each suffering, each joy, 
is a sacrament which gives God to it, so that it ceases to distinguish between them, but breaks through them, and passes by to rest in God himself above all else. It rises to the topmost peak of his heart, even higher than his gifts and his consolations, higher than the joys which come from him. It is characteristic of love never to seek self, to hold back nothing, but to give all to the beloved. Happy the soul that truly loves, for love makes its Lord its captive. This may be the last one I read. I, I think I want to try to talk about this a little bit if I'm capable of it. Um, a, such a soul should make the divine will its food, its daily bread. I have heard this referred to the sacrament of the present moment that that the Christian actually, the Christian soul should strive to recognize God's will in every moment, in everything that happens, in every joy, in every suffering, in every event. And by receiving and adoring actually everything that God sends in every moment, one is in a sense turning every moment into a sacrament. I will repeat this. Um, now I'll go back to the um, prayer of St. Elizabeth. Such a soul should make the divine will its food, its daily bread. It should allow itself to be immolated at the pleasure of the Father, as was the crucified Christ whom it adores. This is hardly the uh, health and wealth gospel here. Um, Jesus demonstrated his um, total abandonment to the divine will, his total embrace of the divine will, his total immolation of, of self to the will of the Father when he accepted being crucified on the cross. That, um, that is the ultimate act of love, evidence of love, and in a much smaller way, we are called to f follow the same path, to follow the same path, to crucify our own desires and our own wants and our own pleasures to the will of God and to accept what he sends us in ador uh, adoring fealty, at whether it is a joy or whether it is a suffering, making every occurrence, every event, each suffering, each joy, a sacrament, which is given to the soul by God, so that it ceases to distinguish between them. Now that this is, of course, a saint speaking, but ceases to distinguish between them because the um, satisfaction, let's say, of accepting everything as from God, the satisfaction of the union of the will with God that's evidenced by accepting that everything that happens as coming from God is a deeper satisfaction than the uh, satisfaction of a consolation or a joy that comes from God. I'm just going to reread that last. I only have a minute or two left. Um, so I'll just reread um, this, this short prayer and um, basically hope, <laughs> hope that it makes sense. Hope that it penetrates. If anyone love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our abode with him. Again the Master tells us that he desires to dwell within us. If anyone love me, it is this which draws God to his creature, not an emotional love, but a love strong as death, which many waters cannot quench. I love the Father, and so I always do the things that please him. Thus spoke our blessed Master, and every soul that longs to keep close to him should live by this word. Such a soul should make the divine will its food, its daily bread. It should allow itself to be immolated at the pleasure of the Father, as was the crucified Christ whom it adores. Every occurrence, every event, each suffering, each joy, is a sacrament which gives God to it, so that it ceases to distinguish between them but breaks through them and passes them by to rest in God himself above all else. 
It rises to the topmost peak of his heart, even higher than his gifts and his consolations, higher than the joys that come from him. It is characteristic of love never to seek self, to hold back nothing, but to give all to the beloved. Happy the soul that truly loves, for love makes its Lord its captive. And so ends the prayer from St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. And so ends our show. I pray that um, it has been useful. I pray that tomorrow the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity may bring you closer to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in the spirit of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, may not only bring you closer to them, but may bring them closer to you to abide in the true temple that now exists in the human heart of a Christian in a state of grace. So with that, it's time for me to say goodbye. You've been listening to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria with me, your host, Roy Showman. And I um, invite you to join us again next week. Same time, same place. Bye for now. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcero, It's best no Oh, 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 oh.